From Nashville, Tennessee, Music City, USA, and the home of Hot Chicken, it's the Rick Altizer Show. Sit back, buckle up. Rick will talk with the movers, shakers, and creators who put Christ in Christian entertainment. He's a man who's clear so the world can hear. Here's Rick Altizer. Thanks, Bob Allen, for your introduction and for being the voice of the Rick Altizer Show. Today is part three of my interview with Steve Taylor. I have never done a three-part interview before, but our conversation was so interesting, I just kept on recording. If you missed either of the previous interviews, you can go to my website and listen to them. That's at rickaltizer.com, and you really want to hear those. Those are, It's a really good interview. Steve is a recording artist, uh, producer, record company executive, film director, and now an educator. Every decade, Steve reinvents himself. In our first interview, we discussed his career as a recording artist and his transition as a music producer. In our second interview, uh, we discussed his success as a producer and then a transition to a record company executive and then the crumbling of that record company. It's a story that's been told too many times, much like my own story, uh, just without all the success parts. <laughs> we begin our show today with a recap of Steve discussing how his movie Blue Like Jazz came about and the challenges that came with it. Steve was so gracious to give me so much time in our interview, and I think it's a fascinating and engaging interview. You'll, you'll want to listen to the earlier shows on my website if you miss them. So without further ado, here is the conclusion to my interview with Steve Taylor. So, so we're going to another decade here. So, yeah, right. so, we, so we, we've gone from the musician to the producer to the uh, record executive right. uh, to you know, losing the company. To now we're transitioning into filmmaker. Yeah, right, right. So you, you, you talked about uh, the, the first film that you made right, with, with right. Michael W. Smith, yeah. The Second Chance. And then you got a hold of a book, right. uh, Blue Like Jazz, yes. and you did something very, very interesting, uh, a way you raised funds. Talk a little bit about how you got funds for that movie. Yes, well, I was looking and we'd finished the movie and, you know, you didn't want to jump into the next project. And I hadn't picked what the next project would be. A friend gave me the book and I read it over Christmas break and uh, loved it. And at that point, Blue Light Jazz, a few people were talking about it, but it was not a bestseller or anything like that. Um, but I read it and I just thought, I want this to be my next movie. I think part of it was... Um, the basic idea, even though it's a m more kind of a memoir collection of almost collection of essays, uh, Don Miller, the author, had grown up in a really conservative uh, Southern Baptist church. Uh, his father had abandoned the family when he was young, um, and he ends up uh, ended up moving to Portland, Oregon, and uh, auditing classes at Reed College in Portland uh, as a young adult. And uh, Reed College has a reputation for a couple things. One, it's where Steve Jobs went to school. And, uh, and also the Princeton Review uh, called it the campus uh, in America most likely to ignore God. So um, <laughs> here's this Southern Baptist kid who now is at the most godless campus in America. And, um, and he writes about the, the tension of being there. Um, and uh, there was a scene in particular where he and some other friends on campus who were so, uh, you know, being a Christian was not... Uh, not uh, not smiled upon at Reed, um, and so he and a, a, some other friends form this kind of underground church. But they they're afraid to get outed, right? And so they decide to essentially to come out of the closet. They build a uh, a confession booth uh, during the big end of the year party on campus, and uh, instead of people coming in and sort of mockingly confessing their sins, he and his friends came out as Christians and said, but they said they're, you know, they're sorry for the fact that the gospel of Jesus has been so diluted and, you know, in many ways poisoned by hypocrisy over the years. And uh, I just loved that scene. I mean, it was kind of like ringing all the bells of my Gee, own existence. Right. Huh. Steve <laughs> yes. Taylor. Interesting in a scene about where hypocrisy is. A... <laughs> right. Right. I mean, it's an ongoing story. With, yeah. With you. Well, and also I'd gone to Boulder, uh, Colorado University in Boulder for school, and that was its own version of Reed College on a much bigger scale. Mm -hmm. So I also felt like on some level I'd lived that story. And so uh, 
So Don Miller was going to be coming and doing a reading uh, in Nashville uh, a few weeks later. A friend of mine arranged for a meeting afterwards, and uh, I pitched him on the idea of turning Blue Light Jazz into a movie. Um, and my pitch was, I just want to make a movie that ends with this confession booth scene. And we worked backwards from there. Um, but I said, honestly, the story of uh, uh, the time he was uh, in his early 30s, I think, that he did this. I said, the, the story of a 30-year-old Christian writer who lives off campus and audits classes at Reed is not a movie story. I, I think your character needs to be a, a, a young college student who lives that experience. So he was intrigued by the idea and said, you know, that sounds interesting. And uh, I said, well, my movie is open on this weekend. Um, so why don't you check that out? And he went and saw The Second Chance in Portland um, uh, that weekend on the, the following Monday. He called me up, said, I want to do this. So we started writing the screenplay. He actually asked if he could be a part of the screenwriting process, which typically you don't want the author there because you're going to change everything. Um, but I eventually agreed to it and sent him to a screenwriting seminar for a few days. So we at least learned the terminology. And uh, he ended up being a great partner and ended up writing a book about the experience of us writing the screenplay for Blue Light Jazz called The Million Miles in a Thousand Years, which is also a great book. And in many ways, I, I think I, uh, there's things about it that I prefer to Blue Light Jazz. While we're writing this, the book ends up blowing up and ends up becoming like a massive New York Times bestseller. It's on the best-selling charts for 42 weeks, I think. Um, it ends up selling like 1.3 million copies. And so while we're writing the screenplay, I just think, oh, man, this is going to be easy. And uh, I just assumed that there would be fellow Christians who had money, who believed in the importance of impact in culture, you know, lining up to help us make this movie. And I was wrong. <laughs> I was very wrong. <laughs> Not so much. Um, I think a couple things happened. One is uh, Christian movie making started sort of metastasizing into a, oh, a Christian movie is something that's geared for the church and uh, it's uh, family entertainment and, um, uh, and, you know, it, it hits certain, certain buttons and it's ultimately a Christian movie should be a, a, uh, a conversion story. And, um, and this was not any of those. Um, and the other aspect of it was that there is no way that you can do the story of a kid who goes to the most godless campus in America and make that stick unless you show a certain amount of what that environment is like. So it doesn't have to be R rated, but if it's not PG-13 rated, it's probably not going to be anything that people would believe, right? So I I think I naively assumed that the the content of the story would be necessary. It'd just be like, you know, telling the story of D-Day without having some explosions and some people dying, you know, that would probably be a ridiculous story, right? Well, I was wrong about that, too. Like, people would look at it and they would see any version of a story with any kind of language or um, suggestion of, you know, the stuff that goes on in a place like Reed College. It says, well, we can't, we can't show that. We can't do that. Um, I'm thinking, well, maybe you've never read uh, the Bible, because uh, if we did a family friendly version of the Bible, that would be a much shorter book, wouldn't it? But that, <laughs> that, I wasn't winning that argument. So um, we finally, after almost four years of trying to scrape the money together, we finally had two investors and we didn't have nearly enough money. But I was so desperate to get the movie made that I just was like, we're just going to we're just going to shoot it with what we've got and I'll figure out a way to finish it later. We just got to get this made. We were going to lose our lead actor. He was going to have to go to, back to work on the HBO show that he was involved in. We just had a window. I, we just got to make this movie. And on the night before we were going to open our production office, one of the investors dropped out. You're listening to The Rick Altizer Show on Bot Radio 89.1 FM, 1160 AM, Nashville. So I called Don... The next day, I said, man, you're not going to believe it, but we can't start the movie. Don had been a great, uh, you know, the author, Don Miller, had been a great uh, advocate and really patient. And, of course, in the meantime, he'd become something of a celebrity himself by virtue of this best-selling book. He was bummed out, understandably, because we'd been working so long on this. So he just blogged about it and said, sorry, you know, we've been working on this for years, but it's not going to happen. The movie is dead. Um, and we couldn't raise the funds that's the end of it. We apologize. And then all these people started writing back saying, 
this is an important movie. We want to see this movie. And uh, and so many of them said some version of, look, I don't have any money, but I'd give you 50 bucks or I could get my friends together. We could pool 100 bucks. We just want to see this movie made. And a couple of guys in Franklin, Tennessee, a couple of young guys in their early 20s, they said, we don't have any money, but they actually put together a little video to send to us. And they said, what if we got on board with one of these brand new uh, crowdfunding websites. It's, there's one called kickstarter.com. And we think there's enough people like us all across the country and even in other countries that want to see this movie made. All of us give a little bit of money and you can make your movie. And uh, so Don called me up. He said, you see the video? I said, yeah. I said, do you want to meet with them? I said, well, you know, I don't have anything better to do. So I got with the guys and they were so enthusiastic and they laid out all how this could happen, um, but I just thought they were hopelessly naive. I I said, look, I love this idea of crowdfunding. I've checked out Kickstarter's website. At that point, it was a you know I don't think it was even a year old. It was but new. nobody, yeah, nobody's talking about Kickstarter. I just said I gone on their website. I love the whole idea, but the most any movie has raised is like fifty thousand dollars. We got to have a quarter million dollars in thirty days, or we can't make this movie. And they said, you have any better ideas? And I didn't. So we launched the Save Blue Light Jazz campaign a few days later. And in 30 days, 4,500 people had given us almost $350,000 to make the movie. And it was, at that point, the biggest raise in crowdfunding history. And, um, uh, and it was remarkable to see that group of people coalesce around this project. And uh, you know how Kickstarter goes. Uh, Give us 25 bucks and we'll send you a poster of the movie. Give us 100 bucks and we'll put your name in the credits as associate producers. Well, I didn't think any of this was going to work. So um, so we ended up with 1,600 associate producers. Uh, their credits at the end of the movie, the normal credits go on the right side. On the left side are 1,600 names of associate producers <laughs> scrolling by. Um, <laughs> and the big one was, I, since I didn't think it was going to work, I said, give us $10 or more and I will call you and thank you personally. Personal phone call from Steve Personal Taylor. phone call. I ended up with a, with a notebook of 3,500 names to call. <laughs> took me a, over a year to call everybody, and but you, I did it. You called and every single person. I called person. every person on the list. And um, the thing I heard most was, well, I know you got a lot of calls to make, so I won't keep you. <laughs> but I got to hear the stories of why people wanted to do this. And one guy in particular, he said... He said, it just seemed like there was a movement of Christians who we don't want to be ripping off culture. We don't want to be remaking stuff that's already been made by the mainstream culture. We want to be creating our own artifacts, you know. And so he's, he was just saying that's why this was so important. It was, it was something bigger than just this movie. Um, and so it was a very gratifying uh, experience, not just – the way the movie got funded, but the way all this came together to create something that, you know, was was pretty new, you know, and it ended up being certainly controversial. Um, uh, there were a lot of fellow Christians that did not appreciate the movie and, you know, for some, I suppose, understandable reasons, just have a hard time with uh, a, a, a faith friendly movie, a movie about Christianity that's not, you know, family oriented um and at the same time um you know this movie also made inroads it was uh, as far as i know the the first quote-unquote christian movie to ever get accepted at a at a major film festival the south premiered at south by southwest and um you know picked up by roadside attractions and uh uh and was a you know it was a really good experience so i had a talk with uh, bill reeves Yes. <laughs> and he said, he said, because uh, we we're talking about what makes a successful Christian movie. Right. Yeah. yeah. He said, Christians don't want to go buy a movie ticket and take their family and be offended. Right. Yes. Yeah. They don't, they just don't want to do that. Yep. And so how do you juggle? I've got this Christian movie. Right. But I can't offend Christians. Right. In it. But yeah, there's yeah. offensive stuff in it. It's about, it's very offensive. Right. It, it's about a, culture that is hostile to the right. gospel so how right. do i portray i mean i'm sorry the passion of the christ right yeah <clears throat> very yeah you know, what they did to jesus was the uh epitome of offensive right yeah it was r-rated right so how does one juggle i mean have you been able to answer right. this question because i mean how do you juggle 
I want to make a movie that talks about a culture that is completely hostile to our message. Right. But if it's going to be successful, right. it can't offend Christians. Right. It can't right. be offensive. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think, you know, Bill, first of all, Bill is a friend of mine, so he wouldn't uh, be surprised at my reaction to that. I think what happens is um, it starts off people make movies based on a passion of wanting to tell a story. And then institutions start getting created around them. And next thing you know, it's the tail wagging the dog. It's the institution that's saying you can you can do this and you can't do that. Right. So in my mind, anybody who says, you know, you can't do this. Well, I'm my attitude was, well, why not? You know, <laughs> it's always been that way. Yeah, too. That right. has been your M.O. from day one. Yeah. Well, you can't make a record with punk rock like that's not right. I mean, people as as talented as you know i remember uh, michael omardian who's a friend and an awesome producer before i ever came out with i want to be a clone he, not to me but he was just saying as a general thing the idea of punk rock and a christian message like that's absurd right that doesn't those two can't go together right oh really well why not who who says right is that in the bible somewhere <laughs> and you know the thought of you can't make a christian movie that will offend people well then let's get rid of vast chunks of the Old Testament, for starters, let's get rid of vast chunks of, of the Bible. Let's get rid of vast chunks of Christian history. You know, th that's absurd. It's like, but the problem is, is that Christian filmmaking, in some ways, it's still in its infancy. Right. And so, you know, we're, we've created a, um, uh, a, uh, an institution around something that still needs to find its way and grow and develop and, and go off in different directions. And, you know, ultimately bands come along in Christian music. We saw this happening with Sixpence and Switchfoot and P.O.D. and on and on and on to where it's not a weird thing for uh, a mainstream recording artist to be a Christian because there is a history of that now. But when it comes to you know Christian filmmaking, we're still in sort of the early stages, and uh, uh, Lord willing, that will change. And, and you know, in some ways, I think we're already seeing the beginnings of it changing. But I tell you this: um, a new generation of of Christian filmmakers, they're not going to put up with that. Uh, in their mind, that's nonsense. Well, that's not. You know, we want to tell authentic stories, right? You're going to tell us that there's a whole whole sphere of storytelling that we're not allowed to engage in we don't believe that and we don't think that's biblical i understand the idea of safe for the whole family i'm all in favor of family entertainment but to say that's all we get to do that's that's just sheer nonsense in case you didn't realize it you're listening to a really nice guy the rick altizer show on bot radio 89.1 fm 1160 a.m nashville and it's interesting that you mentioned because in the 80s, I, I, I see the Christian movie industry today where the Christian music industry was in the 80s, of yes. where you are, you're a product of. Right. Uh, you were kind of driving that train. And so, I mean, I do see what's happening in Christian movies emulating. And now the budgets are getting up and, mm -hmm. and, and the, the secular companies like they did in the 80s right. started funneling money into the Christian music industry right. and buying up the Christian... Now they're funneling money into the Christian movies and saying, right. hey, there's a market here. So yeah. like Christian music in the 70s, which was very, uh, very straight and very one way. And then in the 80s, you began, you came along and started pushing some of those boundaries. And, and people realized, well, you know what? Uh, our Christianity didn't fall apart. We can sing <laughs> about, uh, we can be sarcastic. We can make political statements about blowing up abortion clinics and how, you know, that probably isn't the best way for us to cast our vote against abortion. Right. Uh, and you know what? We, we got through it. And I think, you know, perhaps maybe in the years to come, we'll, we'll see that as well. So then real quick, because I know we're running out of time. Um, so then from uh, the movie producer now here at Lipscomb, right. you're, you're transitioning into educating a younger generation. Talk about that and how you're enjoying that. Well, I love uh, teaching. I started off as a youth pastor. And so um, hopefully there's always been a component of that with everything that I've been doing through the years. Um, but uh, I, I, I love teaching. I also love being a part of a Christian community like this. And so um, if I was at a different institution, there was a 
there would be a part of who I am that I wouldn't really that would be tricky to address. Not the case here. Um, and so I, I love this environment. You know, I also love they give me so much freedom. So I've still got a band going, you know, with Peter Furler from Newsboys and Jimmy Abeg and John Mark Peener. So I still get to tour and make music and um, and uh, and you know, still do filmmaking. So it's a it's a pretty great environment. But uh, I I gotta say I you know I just finished coming uh, out of a screenwriting class and um, man there's nothing greater than uh, doing something like teaching screenwriting and then they turn in their assignment it's like whoa a lot of these are like really good you know and whoa I would have loved to go to a screenwriting class in college and be learning this stuff and you know how much better are this next generation of screenwriters you know a lot of the reason Christian filmmaking the Christian films aren't so good is because frankly the writing's not very good and uh, that was one of Bob Briner who wrote Rowing Lambs that was one of his things is we gotta start putting out better writers you know and uh, starting at the basics and so uh, it's nice to be a part of that process I don't know Handel was a pretty good songwriter and Bach they they did they did 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 okay yeah that's right (laughs) <laughs> so, I mean, uh, there is something to say about uh, creative talent if you're going to communicate a, a message to do it creatively. Yeah, you get a platform by excellence that you don't get any other way. And I'm not aware of anybody in our industry that exudes that better than you. <laughs> well, that's uh, you nice. know, I mean, I'm, I'm not that. here trying to blow smoke at you or whatever, but uh, uh, that has kind of been your MO. It's like, you know, we're going to do this one way. We're going to do it as excellent as we can. If it's successful, great. If it's not, okay, whatever. You know, I'm not chasing uh, anybody's dollar. I'm not trying to be a version of somebody else. I'm just going to go and uh, do what God has given me to do to my utmost. And I think that is a, a lesson we can all learn from this and take away that we're all in different positions and different places in your work and your in your church and, and and you might not be a filmmaker maybe you want to be a filmmaker or maybe you want to do music or or whatever someone listening here but i think that we do what we do excellently unto the lord with with everything we have because we're doing it for him it's for an audience of one and at that point when you can get out of the i'm doing it to get affirmation i'm doing it for validation i'm doing it so people will say these things about me or to prove that i'm a this or a that and it's really just out of a heart of, God, I want to serve you, and I want to serve your body. I want to serve the body. What I have found from my own, my, in my own experience, that's the most freeing thing of all. So when, I could, when I could get away from having to find validation in what I do, having to find some kind of success, chasing some kind of success, and to me, then redefining what that success is. Mm-hmm. Success for me is ministering to the body. Speaking something that's true, that's real, that's vulnerable, that isn't fake, mm-hmm. that's success. And then however God wants to do with it, then that's great. So, and you are that, you know. I mean, I, you're one of the first guys I called when I got this radio show because I wanted to interview you because I just knew it would be amazing. <laughs> so, I know, and what a disappointment it's ultimately been. <laughs> But hopefully you can find, you know, five good minutes in here. <laughs> oh, I got plenty. Thank you for taking so much time with us, Steve. Just just awesome. Thank you so much. And thank you for pouring into the younger generation of filmmakers here in Nashville. And uh, I know God is going to continue to bless all that you do. Thank you, Rick. It's been a pleasure. Well, that concludes part three of my interview with Steve Taylor. Wow. Steve gave me so much of his time. And I appreciate his heart, his insight, and his friendship. If you missed any of the previous interviews, you can go to my website, rickaltizer.com, and listen or share with your friends. Speaking of sharing with your friends, you can like me on my Facebook page, facebook.com slash Show. Isn't that funny? Please like me. Is this culture about self or what? Also, if you go to my website and click the contact button, I will send you a free download of my scripture memory album. It's my way of saying thanks for listening. That's at rickaltizer.com. And by the way, Altizer is spelled A-L-T-I-Z-E-R. Thanks to my sponsor, Paul Winkler, the investor coach, paulwinkler.net. Most importantly, thank you for listening. I'll see you next week. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not brag and is not arrogant.
elegant It is not rude, it does not Insist on its own way It is not easily angered love But rejoices in the truth Love bears all things Believes all things Hopes all things Endures all things Love never 